John chapter number 21, uh, if you'll turn there in the Bible, and, and I'm going to plead with you. I know, listen, I know it's the Midwest. I grew up in the Northeast. It's even worse. I know it's the Midwest. I know it's the middle of summer. I know some of you are kind of looking at me like, who are you? And I'm kind of looking at you like, who are you? And uh, let's, let, can I ask for a little bit of participation and you help me out tonight? Just, I wanted to hear if, know if you're listening. And so we're going to read through almost the entire passage of John chapter 21. Not all at once. We'll go through the, the message little by little. But uh, there in the very first part of John 21, it says, After these things, okay? After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples. I don't even need my Bible. Look at that. Right there. It's right on the screen. That's so cool. Um, after these things. So if it says after these things, obviously some things have happened, right? So let's get caught up on what things have happened. This is the last chapter of John chapter 21. John, the book of John is written by John. Very good. Now, you, come on. You guys are going to have to help me. I've already pleaded with you once. The book of John is, is written by? John. There we go. I knew if I cried, they'd do it. I knew it. Um, John is written by John. Okay, that's an easy one. Uh, the next couple questions are a little harder, okay? Uh, they're, they're maybe fourth, fifth grade level uh, questions. So I'll help you out. If you need help, I'll, I'll fill in the answer. But then I may ask you to do the answer again, okay? So what has happened so far? Oh, by the way, John chapter 21 is written by John. But who's, who's really this chapter about? It's about Jesus. Very good. Okay, I know. Why are we here, God? I know the answer to everything is Jesus. No. I'm not making fun. A little bit I am. Okay. Uh, John chapter 1 was written about, some, I heard someone else say it. Who, who's the main character? I know Jesus is, he really is honestly the main character, but it's about Peter. It's about Peter. Very good. Peter, John's in jail in the sailboat. Uh, it's about Peter. Peter is going to be the main character in who we're studying. And right now, as we know, if this is the last chapter in the book of John, this is about uh, when Jesus comes by and, 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 and the disciples are fishing on a boat, Peter is in a good place or a bad place in his life? Bad place. He's in a bad place. He's in a very, uh, uh, very, very bad place. In fact, if we, we know, we know Peter, man, age, probably the only disciple over the age of 21. He's probably the leader of the disciples, not just by age, but by how much faith he has, and he's willing to do whatever. I mean, this is the guy who stepped out on the water, off the boat, and was like, hey, I don't care. I know you guys don't, but I believe Jesus. If he says I can walk on water, I'll walk on water. And we see amazing faith by him. We also see him, you know, he's the guy that's cutting off the ear of the Roman soldier. You're not going to take my Jesus. I'll, I'll, Jesus, I'm with you till the end. And then Jesus says, hey, one of you guys are going to deny me. Oh, not going to be me. He says, actually, yeah, it's going to be you. And you're going to do it three times. And we're not talking about like high level denial, like knife to the throat, spear to the side, gun to the head. We're talking like a junior high school girl says, hey, ain't you one of them Jesus people? And he's like, no. Nuh-uh, and, he, and he, I'll prove it, and he lets out a string of curse. I mean, this guy has just low-level denied Christ and did it three times just as Jesus had foretold. He has gone from being like number one on the list, Jesus saying, I'm upon this rock will I build my church, you're gonna be, you're, you are going to go out and start the beginning of the church. Peter doesn't know the end of the story. We know the end of the story. We know, man, you just flip one chapter over into the book of Acts, go one book over, and we find out Peter's going to be okay. He's, he's going to be all right. He's, gonna, he's going to live out his Christianity. He is going to prove that Peter was, a, was vital to the beginning era of the church. But right now, Peter doesn't know that, does he? Peter's in a bad place. Peter's probably wondering at this point, do I even have a place in the kingdom of God. In fact, if you look at verse number two, it says there were together Simon Peter and Thomas, called Didymus, and Nathaniel of Canaan and Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples. Six other disciples are with Peter. There's seven disciples in total. Peter says to them in verse number three, I go, everyone say it with me, I go what? A fishing. They say unto him, we also go with thee. When you decide to just say, forget it, it doesn't just affect you. 
It affects other people. How many of you have ever been fishing before? How many of you enjoy fishing? Okay, I burnt my wife out on fishing uh, a long time when we first got married. I said, hey, do you like fishing? She's like, yeah. She was being that good wife, you know, like, hey, I'll do whatever you want me to do. I was like, sweet. We went fishing like literally three weeks, three weeks in a row every day, 24-7. She's like, okay, I lied to you. I really don't like it. I love fishing. I love sitting there. My, my favorite place, my favorite way to fish, I know some of you guys are probably those, you know, the bass fishermen where you got to work. All, you know, like, you, uh, not me. I like to sit in a chair, not do anything, just cast my line out and just relax. But this is not that type of fishing. In fact, this type of fishing really honestly represents what Peter used to do. In fact, it doesn't just represent it. It is what Peter used to do. In fact, when Jesus came to Peter, he was what? He was fishing. He was doing everything in his own power. He was working out life. I've got it. I know what to do. I'll work. I'll provide money for myself. In turn, it'll provide money for my family. This is how the world works. This is how you provide for yourself. You work, therefore you receive, and you build your kingdom. And then Jesus came to him with this radical idea. He said, hey, (laughs) you're going to love this. Here's a great proposition. Okay, I know that everything's good in your life, but I want you to leave everything that's good in your life, and I want you to be homeless. You won't know where the next meal's coming from. We're going to travel a lot. Are you guys in? Oh, by the way, you're going to have to leave your entire family too. I forgot to mention that part. And there were some disciples that said, to follow the Messiah? Yeah, we'll do it. Anything you want, Jesus, we are on your side. We will follow you. And for three and a third years, they followed Jesus Christ and saw him do great and mighty things. Peter has now gone back to that. He's gone back to providing for himself, much like us as Christians, when we get saved and we say, oh, thank you so much for salvation. I've got it from here. And we start doing things in our own ability and our own power, and we put our faith in Christ for salvation, but not faith in him to live our life for him. Peter has walked away. Did you know that you can be sitting in the pew tonight and you're still fishing? Did you know you can be up here preaching the word of God and fishing? Going through the motions, but yet saying, I don't know really if God really wants to use me. I'd rather step away from faith And do things in my own power and build my dream, not his kingdom. And Peter has done that. And when he does it, six other disciples said, we'll go with you. Look at verse number three again. Peter said, I'm going to go fishing. They said unto him, we also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship. How soon? Immediately. And that night they caught nothing. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. By the way, you can be sitting in the pew, and while you're fishing, Jesus can be staring you in the face. Pastor Tony can be bringing the message, bringing the word of God. God is wanting to show you something, and he's right in front of you. Oh, so close. He's right in front of you, showing himself, and you don't even see him. Why? Because you're fishing. You're doing things in your own power. And it may have been just last week you stepped out on faith, but it is a daily process. And if you don't continue that daily process, Jesus can be staring you in the face tonight in the pew. Or not in the pew, you got chairs now. Uh, In the chair. And you don't even see him. The disciples don't even recognize him. If we read further in the passage, we realize they're not very far from shore. They should have recognized him, but they didn't even realize that it was him. Then verse number five. Then Jesus saith unto them, what is wrong with you? No. He uses a term of endearment. He says, children, children, have you any meat? And they answered him, what? No. Because does working in your own power ever really work out for you? Solomon did all that, didn't he? Solomon, if he dreamt it, he had it. Came to wives, had it thousand of them poor guy (laughs) solomon says "Ah, i'm gonna get into irrigation i'll build myself a forest 
says, you know what, my, my house is going to take 10 years to build. The, the, the temple took seven years to build. His house took 10 years to build. And he had a house for every single one of his wives. If you look up in Kings and find out what the portion was that he had available to himself for a party every single night to feed ten to 15,000 people every single night. When it came to parties, he made your 4th of July barbecue look pathetic. He had everything that he possibly could want. He had it all. He built his kingdom. If you think you can build a kingdom bigger than Solomon, good luck. And at the end, the guy who built the biggest kingdom said, vanity. Nothing. Zero. Children, how is doing things in your own power working out for you? Is it working? And the answer is always no. It's not working. Then Jesus says in verse number six, cast the net on the right side of the ship and you shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus, this is by the way, my favorite verse in the entire universe of universes. Okay, Uh, therefore that disciple, remember we did a little history lesson. Who wrote the book of John? Okay, John, right? So this is John writing this. Keep this in mind. Now therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved, who is the disciple whom Jesus loved? John. Come on, John. That's kind of, John. Can you picture him writing this on the island of Patmos? You know, he's writing it, he's going, and John, no, not John. The disciple whom Jesus loved. (laughs) Me. Saith unto Peter, it is the Lord. They're in the ship. John is in the same boat as Peter. And he walks over to him. He says, <clears throat> it's the Lord. He says, I'm sorry, what? It's the Lord. It's Mr. Moore? Is that what he said? No. It's the Lord. It's the Lord. It's Jesus. It's the Lord. And he says, oh, it's Jesus. It's Jesus. Now, I want you to put yourself in this place. I want you to picture. Okay, don't picture this too much. Okay. <laughs> Now when Simon Peter heard it, that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked and did cast himself into the sea. This has got to be one of the, like I said, don't picture it too much, but this has got to be one of the most hilarious scenes in, in, in the Bible. I mean, here is Peter, and, he said, and John comes to him and says, hey, it's the Lord. And I, I picture John on the island of Patmos. I mean, John was the only one that did not get martyred. He was sent to the island of Patmos where he wrote uh, a lot of the word of God. And I can picture him sitting there almost like weeping, crying, and laughing over this story. As he's writing this out and he's going, oh my goodness, I can't. As I'm writing this down, I'm remembering how Peter is just looked like a moron. Like, oh my goodness. Peter, all of a sudden he realizes, oh, it's Jesus. I mean, for just a second here, pretend that you're the Messiah. I know that's impossible, okay? But just for a second, put yourself in the Messiah's shoes. He comes out, he rolls the stone away, right? And he comes out and he goes, hey, disciples. Where, where are you? Oh, they must, they're probably telling people about me. They're probably saying, hey, they're probably getting a crowd together. They're probably getting ready for a big worship service. And uh, everything's going to be great. So so I'm just going to go find them real quick. And if I'm Jesus and I come and I'm walking on the sea or by the Sea of Tiberias. And I'm like, is that, no way. Is that, is that the sons of Zebedee? Oh my good! And it's Peter too. And he's naked. Oh, oh my word. And John, what is wrong with you? Oh my God. I told him three days. I'm like, this is going all wrong. These are, and these are the people that I invested three and a third years with. I invested all my time, all my effort. I healed people. I fed 4,000, 5,000. What was I supposed to, maybe I was supposed to feed 10,000. I don't know. What, what would it made them to believe? I can't understand this. Oh, hey, what is wrong with you? Get over here right now. I mean, that's how I would act. But this is not, no, I wouldn't. Yeah, I would actually. I'd probably be worse. The, 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 Peter is now realizing, oh, oh no, it's the Lord. And he realizes that he's naked. And I know we're being funny a little, but th- let's be honest. When, when we get convicted and we see Jesus, we're exposed. And sometimes we act a little funny afterwards. Because Peter right now, and we're about to find out in just a moment, he is maybe convicted, but he is not changed. All he does is see the Lord and he goes, ah, what do I do? And, and 
and he goes and puts clothes on and then jumps into the sea. You'd think it'd be the other way around. Then the next verse in verse number 8, look what happens. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from the land. But as it were, 200 cubits dragging the net with fishes. I can picture them going by Peter and going, why did he jump over the... Why is he swimming? He could have just taken the boat in. You know, Peter just doesn't know what to do. He runs and he jumps into the sea. He's acting crazy. And then the disciples, they come in dragging the net with the fishes. Verse number 9, as soon as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid thereon and bread. And Jesus saith unto them, bring of the fish which ye have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to the land full of great fishes and 153 for there were not so many, yet was not the net broken. Then Jesus saith unto them, I can't understand. You guys are just honestly the dumbest people I've ever, I've ever encountered in my life. I literally told you three days. De- no, he doesn't. What does he say? He says, come and dine. Remember, you guys sing the hymn? Come and dine, the master calleth. Come and dine. That's what the song's about. When I was a kid, I thought it was about Sunday afternoon dinner. Roast beef. I was like, hey, come on down. Woo. In fact, this is, this is actually the truth. On some Sunday nights, my dad, pastors the main start of the church back in 1988, we would have on Sunday nights uh, uh, requests. Like you could raise your hand. It was always either I want that mountain or come and dine. I always picked those two because they mentioned food in them. Grapes of Eshel. I'm like thinking, man, that'd be awesome. Big old grape. Oh. Um, anyway, side note. Uh, he says unto them, come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask him, who art thou? (laughs) They knew that it was the Lord. Now is about to take place the most awkward dinner in all of history. In fact, the Bible doesn't mention that there's anything that is said during this whole dinner. Jesus cometh and taketh the bread and giveth them, and the fish likewise. You ever been there? You ever been with your family? Or some of you are maybe relapsing or... Or remembering back when dad got mad at mom, yelled and banged on the table. Everyone was like. (laughs) You're laughing because it happened, didn't it? (laughs) (laughs) And you just, and no one says a word. You just, you're just sitting there like, oh, no one is saying anything. If I'm Jesus, I'm kind of like giggling inside. I'm like, Look at these guys. They look pathetic. Here's the disciples. They're eating food. No one's saying anything. Then finally Jesus breaks the silence. In verse number 15 it says, So when they had dined, then Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? Now, if you read commentaries or anything like that, you try to find out what is the these. I don't think it matters. I think it matters what the these is. You fill in the these. We all have these. I've got these, you've got these. He says to Simon Peter, do you love me more than these? (laughs) Simon Peter says, yeah, of course I do. Of course I love you. I mean, remember me? Like, Peter, first of all, you know all things. Number two, remember? Remember, like, Garden of Gethsemane? (laughs) Roman ear. You guys remember that? Walking on water. This is me. It's Peter. Of course, I love you. And he says, feed my sheep. Simon Peter, do you love me? He says, of course, Lord, I love you. You know all things. He says, feed my sheep. Then he says the third time, and it's not in the English language. It's not really a good way to translate it. If you look in the original text the first two times he says peter do you phileo me do you love me do you love me with a brotherly type love do you like me do you enjoy spending time with me do you did you enjoy it when i fed the four thousand do you enjoy my company when everything is going okay and it's accommodating to have a kind of a cool friendship and then the third time He says, Peter, do you agape me? Do you love me with an unconditional love? Because Peter, I loved you with an unconditional love. 
I died for you. And then he goes on to say in uh, verse number uh, 17, this is the, the third time that he says Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? He said unto the Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said unto him, feed my sheep. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, Thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest, but when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, say it with me, he saith unto him, what? Follow me. Do you love me? Yes, I love you. Do you love me? Yes, I love you. Do you have an unconditional love for me? Yes, I do. Then follow me. Follow me. Now everything changes and we find out that Peter's still not in a repentive state. The next verse is that he turns around, he looks and then he finds John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. In fact, he says, John pens the words again, the disciple whom Jesus loved. He says, he looked and he finds John. He says, yeah, you're saying that I have to die for you, but what is John going to have to do? Isn't that the extent of our Christianity? I'm willing to serve you, God. I'm willing to do whatever you want me to do, just not more than anybody else. What are they going to have to do? And Jesus says, does that even matter, Peter? Does that matter? I died for you. I gave everything for you. I became sin. God can't even look in the face of sin. My own father rejected me. He couldn't even look in my face. I did that for you. Would you follow me? Yeah, I'll follow you. Yeah, follow me in the good times. Follow me when it's the feeding of the 4,000, the feeding of the 5,000, and I'm healing people, and everything's going great. But you are going to die for me, Peter. Are you okay with that? Are you willing to take everything and throw it away for me? When I read that, I get so convicted and I say, everything? Like Pastor Tyler saying, you mean like all to Jesus I surrender? Everything? You want everything? You want my preferences? You want my family? You want my time? You want what I wear? You want what I listen to? You want everything? Yes, I want everything. Are you willing To give up these. Do you love me more than these? And if we're honest with ourselves, the answer is no. The answer is 90%. The answer is 95%. The answer is 99%. Does it matter? Does it matter what percent it is unless it's 100? I'm a really good Christian. I love you more than 99% of these. So, we are so selfish, Pastor Tony. I'm so selfish. I have, and by the way, my these, if we really open ourselves up, look inside and do a little surgery on ourselves, we find out what our these are, and we do so well at hiding them, don't we? No one else sees our these. Because, it, because if we go to church the correct amount of times, we don't curse at work, we fill out all these and, and all that and we check our list down and we do a really good job at hiding what we wouldn't give God. Pastor Tony came in and said, all right, church, I have an awesome plan. We're going to reach people. You're going to love this. We are going to reach the world. And this is where it's going to start. I know you guys love air conditioning. I know you love it. I know you love it. But for the summer, we're going to shut down the A.C., Okay, I know it's going to be a little hot. I know it's going to be a little warm. You're going to come in here. You're going to be like, oh, man, it's a little uncomfortable. It's okay. We're just going to do it for one summer. This is how much money we'll save if we shut the air conditioning down. We will save this amount. We're going to send that to a church in Uganda. And it's going to help to reach 1,000 people for Christ. How many of you wouldn't step foot in this place all summer long? Oh, yeah, that's me. I love Jesus. 100% more than AC. We're really good at lying to ourselves. 
Oh, I'd die for Jesus. I just won't give him my air conditioning. You wouldn't die for Jesus. You wouldn't be one of those people that are killed by ISIS. You wouldn't do it. You wouldn't sit there. We're spoiled brats in America. We'd die for our country before we'd die for Jesus. By the way, I'm pointing down here because I really should be pointing at myself because if I really open myself up and I look at these, oh, I'm like Peter, I'm exposed and naked. Peter, we know, is going to make the right decision. We know he's going to say, you know what, I'm going to follow you. We don't see it in John chapter 21. We look in the book of Acts and we find out Peter does. In fact, he is crucified. In fact, not in the Bible, but as history tells, he wouldn't die with his arms stretched upright and upright on a cross. He didn't want to be crucified the way Christ was crucified. He had himself crucified upside down. He died for Christ. In fact, 11 of the 12 disciples died. John was the only one that survived. They boiled him in oil and they sent him on the island of Patmos to die by himself. But yeah, he didn't have to die. And these were the people that turned the world upside down for Jesus Christ. And we're still, you are feeling the the ripple effects from it today. The beginning of the church. What could God do with Fellowship Baptist Church if they said, everything? You've got it, God. Everything. My preferences. We leave churches for the most pathetic reasons, Brother Tony. Well, the preacher before was a better preacher. I don't like the worship here. I mean, there's the extent of our Christianity. Like, we'll leave a church, a church that we are bound to, that we are in covenant with God. This is our church. This, we are going to reach people for Christ. Yeah, but I like pews better than chairs. By the way, Pastor Tony didn't say me. I don't think anyone ever do that. But what I'm saying is that's the extent of our Christianity. It's, am I comfortable? Uh, I'm not going to have to do something more than him, am I? (laughs) Guys, I come to you with shoulders drooped, looking at you saying, what's wrong with us? What's wrong with me? Am I really a follower of Christ? Am I willing to give him everything? All to Jesus I surrender. He died for you. I'm not saying you're going to have to die for him, but would you follow him to the death? Would you, would you do anything for him? Would you put your preference down? Would you put your comfortability down? If he said, I want you to leave this nation and go to another country and give the gospel, would you do it? Would you pack up your family? Would you uproot yourself? 